welcome to our review of inauguration 2021. Uh, I want to apologize for having to record this uh, ahead of time, but uh, um, I spend every January hacking and coughing and hopefully I won't while we're doing this, but I'm going to the tropics and not going to come back and get sick. So, so I'm sorry that not all of the details of the inauguration are uh, public yet. We don't know uh, what the president is going to do or not do, um, but uh, we can talk about past inaugurations and, and uh, what has happened and uh, enjoy this. So I hope you uh, get some fun factoids out of this and, and an appreciation of the inauguration. Uh, but we want, we want to begin with a question, why? Why are we having an inauguration? We have to understand that uh, and be clear about it in order to um, give a good um, uh, introduction to it. Um, it's called Democracy's Big Day. Uh, and the problem with that slogan is that we're not a democracy. But this is when we celebrate democracy anyway. Uh, we're not a democracy because we have an electorate college and we count by state. Uh, rather than uh, counting up the number of individuals, and there's no official national count. Uh, we do take one nowadays, but, um, but there's no official national count. We're not a democracy, but we celebrate the ideal of democracy at the inauguration. Uh, this time, the popular vote winner is also going to be the one uh, who's inaugurated He's, because he is also the Electoral College winner. Uh, this is what happens most of the time. Uh, so we are here to celebrate democracy and the principle of it, even if we don't exactly practice it. We're celebrating one man, one vote. Nowadays, we call it one person, one vote. Uh, and it only dates to 1962. The case of Baker versus Carr at the Supreme Court is the one that established that principle. And this is well within my lifetime. Before 1962, there was no reapportionment requirement uh, of states for the uh, House of Representatives, and there was county unit voting in Maryland and in some other states. So we celebrate representative democracy, which is really what we have and what we've uh, tried to build uh, with the one man, one vote idea. And that takes place in the Congress. Representative democracy is symbolized and celebrated at the Capitol and not at the White House. The Capitol is the symbol of our democracy. It is the people's house. Representative democracy is at the Capitol because we are the first branch of government. More than half of the Constitution is about the legislative branch. The other two branches gather for the ceremony uh, but representative democracy itself is embodied in the Congress, which meets at the Capitol. So respect is paid by all three branches to democracy at the real and symbolic center of our representative democracy. The focus is on the president, of course, but he was elected by the Electoral College. And <clears throat> uh, even the Electoral College pays respect to representative democracy, because if there's not a majority, the vote the vote must have at least been close. Um, and there, thereby, we do pay respect to democracy through the Electoral College. But we're here representing 471 separate elections. 435 members of the House were all reelected or, or are new. Uh, 33 senators were reelected or are new. There were two special Senate elections in Arizona and Georgia, and we have one president and vice president running on ticket. So that's 471 uh, separate elections. Uh, there were also 63 previous Senate elections, the senators having continued in office and won't be up for either two or four years. And there were two <clears throat> Senate runoff elections. Uh, and all of these numbers add up to more than 1,200 candidates, and that's what I want to talk about. More than 1,200 political candidates equals a lot of promises, because promises are how you get elected. And a lot of promises 
were sorted out by the voters. This is the, the uh, action that takes place in voting. Who made the most realistic and believable promises? And then the voters uh, cast their ballots in 536 elections that we're celebrating here. The total number of members of Congress plus the president uh, and vice president on the ticket. That's 536 winners that are gathered here uh, in Washington for this occasion. Each one was elected number one in their district or their state or the electoral college. That is, we have 536 winners, 536 number ones. But wait a minute, there's no such thing as 536 number ones. It's ridiculous. It's mathematically impossible. But there is a mathematical term for it. Can you guess what that is? It's chaos. 536 number ones gives us chaos. I have been in Washington for 55 years now. I have spent eight years observing before I got to Washington that 63 years, which I calculate to be 25% of American history, that I have been watching what's been going on in Washington. And I can tell you that the confusion and chaos here is very real. Uh, it is exactly what is produced uh, when you have 536 number ones. So why do we bother? What are we really celebrating with this inauguration? Confusion and chaos? Why do we bother? Because there is a positive synonym for chaos. Chaos means no order, and that makes us uncomfortable. But if you enforce equality, if you enforce one person, one vote, you are destroying order, and that is representative democracy, the possibility of dis destroying order. But everybody loves democracy. So if one person, uh, one vote equals representative democracy, everybody loves democracy in theory, but what about in practice? Suppose the other guy had won, how would you feel about this election. Therefore, chaos is the same as representative democracy, but how do we get from the chaos that makes us uncomfortable to democracy, which we love? Well, in chemistry, you call it a catalyst. Something has to be added to the chaos to get democracy. And that something is faith. Belief, if you will, in democracy. If you believe that our system can produce democracy or at least representative democracy, then the exercise is worth it. Then democracy can actually result. What we're trying to get with our election, what we celebrate with the inauguration is representative democracy. Congress is where we come together in representative democracy. And I get to work with a prominent former member of Congress named Bob Carr. And he says, when he's talking to groups on the floor of the House of Representatives, that Congress is where we come together to argue. Well, I'm gonna add a live and good corollary to that as I often do on my tours and say, Congress is where we come together to argue without killing each other. And that's what representative democracy is all about. That's our function in the midst of the chaos and confusion that representative democracy produces. We celebrate in the inauguration, the arguments, the chaos, the confusion of representative democracy. Representative democracy is at the Capitol in the building where it happens. We have 536 separate elections to celebrate. 471 winners this time, 63 prior elections, two special elections. 536 winners and 536 losers. In fact, out of 1,200 candidates, there were at least 650 losers or more. We're here to celebrate the losers as well as the winners because democracy is the process by which we operate and not the victory. Inauguration celebrates the process and not the victory. 
What if the other guy had won? How would you feel about the inauguration? Democracy is equality. Democracy requires equality. Democracy does not equal victory. It does not mean my side wins. It does not mean that the good guys win necessarily. Democracy does mean that everybody has an equal chance. Democracy does mean that we must practice equality. We must believe in equality. Everyone has a right to have an opinion. Even if we believe that opinion is wrong, we must revere their right to have it. Equality means diversity of people and opinions. And in democracy means we honor people and opinions, particularly the ones we disagree with, because we revere the people and opinions and the right to disagree. Democracy means we revere the losers. We celebrate democracy by honoring the losers as well as the victory. So the 2021 inauguration theme is that the inauguration celebrates democracy as the exercise of equality. Now let's talk a little bit about the history of um, inaugurations, a quick history of the locations. There have been 11 of them, starting with the Federal Hall in New York City, Independence Hall twice, and then they moved to Washington in 1801, did it in the House chamber uh, and outside at the Brick Capitol, and finally in the Hall of the House. And then they moved to the East Front Steps in 1829, and it was there 35 times, interrupted by the weather and by ill health of the president in 1945. But now we've moved to the West Front, and this is the 10th time that it will be held on the West Front. The first inauguration was in New York City. This is Alan Cox's version from the Cox corridors in the Capitol building. Uh, then twice in Philadelphia at uh, Independence Hall. Uh, and then Thomas Jefferson was the one to be elected after the, what he called the Revolution of 1800, 1801 in Washington. Uh, and in the midst of a crisis, there had been a tie in the Electoral College. Uh, 35 failed votes in the House had not produced a, a president. And we eventually had to amend the Constitution to prevent this situation from happening again. But Thomas Jefferson, in his inaugural address, said, we are all Republicans, we are all Federalists. And that is why he and how he went about recognizing the fact that the losers are to be honored at the inauguration as well as the winners. Now, this is what the Capitol looked like by the end of the Jefferson administration. There were two uh, separate buildings for the House and the Senate and a wooden walkway in between. So that was the setting for inaugurations. Uh, but then the British came and burned that in 1814. Uh, on the left is the Capitol in ruins. On the right is uh, the brick temporary Capitol. It was built across the street. And that is where President Monroe was inaugurated in uh, 1817. Now they had that inauguration outside because the House and the Senate could not agree on whose chamber they were gonna use. So the president finally just said, oh, let's just have it outside. So that was the first outside inauguration after uh, George Washington's taking the oath. The Capitol, uh, as originally planned, was com completed by 1824. So the 1825 inauguration took place, place in there. But in 1829, Andrew Jackson invited so many people to the inauguration, he wanted the whole country to be able to see it. And uh, so they arranged to do it outside on the East Front Steps. And we stayed there. Uh, for 35 inaugurations through 18, uh, 1977 from 1829. This is the depiction of Jackson's inauguration also from the Cox corridors uh, in the Capitol. Uh, here's a drawing of President William Henry Harrison's inauguration in 1841. That was a real biggie. Uh, the proportions here are exaggerated, but uh, uh, this is probably the feeling that one would have had uh, at that inauguration. This is the first photograph of inauguration. President James Buchanan in 1857 is the first uh, to be um, uh, photographed. 
then the Capitol was extended. You had the, the wings on each end and a new dome started in 1861. This is probably around 1865. Um, but, it, but the inauguration is on the other side. This is the drawing of the Capitol the way it was, was to look. Uh, and the inauguration was held on this side. Uh, continue. This is Lincoln's second inauguration. And uh, if you blow it up, you get the, the person that they've identified as probably being John Wilkes Booth watching and uh, hoping you can get a shot at Lincoln then. Uh, but the interesting thing is the audience. This is what Lincoln could see uh, as he looked off to the left during his address. And you can see those sticks in the front there. Those are crutches of the uh, wounded soldiers that were invited to sit in the front of the crowd for Lincoln's second inauguration, a reminder of what was going on in the country. The war was still ongoing. And, um, and so for the inauguration, they placed these uh, wounded soldiers in front to, to, to uh, honor them and the sacrifices that they and others were making uh, in the midst of this war. This is President Garfield's inauguration, 1881. You can see it's kind of crude looking and, and you have this great wall barricade uh, built up to keep the crowd down below, kind of awkward looking. Uh, this is a hundred years ago, President Harding in 1921. And then we decided to move it to the other side in 1981. The, uh, Orange arrow on the right shows where it had been held since 18, uh, 1829. And on the left is the arrow where it is held now. We moved it to the other side because there's a lot more room on the other side for larger crowds. In 1985, Ronald Reagan's uh, inauguration was planned outside, but it was so cold that morning that they moved it inside and had great crowds packed into the rotunda. Um, but this is the inauguration from uh, Four years ago, uh, the stand that was built on the west front and the one that's under construction looks a lot like that uh, today. Now let's go over what happens on inauguration day. Um, the new first family stays at the Blair House across the street from the White House. That's the official guest house. Um, usually the, the uh, incoming president goes to a church service that morning. This is John Kennedy. Uh, at mass the morning before his inauguration. And then they usually have coffee at the White House. It seems unlikely that that will happen this time, uh, but that's the tradition that the, the uh, outgoing president recognizes the legitimacy of the election by, by uh, entertaining the incoming uh, first family at, uh, at the White House before they start, uh, usually in the red room or the blue room. Um, this is, uh, Incoming President Woodrow Wilson and outgoing President William Howard Taft uh, in uh, 1913, uh, getting ready to travel to the Capitol. Uh, here's President Eisenhower, uh, probably um, 1953, uh, with Mrs. Eisenhower traveling to the Capitol. Of course, there are always religious leaders. Uh, uh, this is Billy Graham, who attended more and prayed at more inaugurations than anyone else in history. Um, and then there's the oath. And it's interesting that George Washington took the oath in front of the people. He went in and gave his inauguration uh, address inside to the Congress, but the oath he felt that the witnesses of that oath should be the people, that he is taking the oath to them. And so he took the oath outside and then went inside to, to give his address. Uh, first, they do the vice presidential oath, and this is George H.W. Bush, um, one of his two times. Uh, this is President Grant taking the oath 1873 uh, uh, in a drawing and, and uh, President McKinley 1897. Uh, this is President Hoover 1929 and President Carter 1977. Now they usually take the oath on a Bible and this is George Washington's Bible which is often used for that purpose now. Uh, this is Abraham Lincoln's Bible which is all, also often used. And one of the interesting things to note is whether the Bible is open or closed. Here, both Barack Obama and Donald Trump take the oath on a stack of Bibles, uh, but they're not open. Here is Bill Clinton uh, as president and Mike Pence as vice president, having the Bible open to a particular verse that they are, that they are using to symbolize the importance of the oath. Uh, then there's the inaugural address. 
And uh, this is President Hoover, 1929, uh, Harry Truman, 1949, Ronald Reagan, 1981, uh, Barack Obama, 2009. And uh, then there's a signing ceremony. Uh, the Congress has already met usually for 20 days or so, and they can pass a lot of legislation in that time. So the president signs the bills that are that need to get moving immediately. Um, then the outgoing president uh, leaves. This is Jimmy Carter about to take his last flight on, uh, as president on uh, Air Force One. Uh, that departure may not happen that way this time. Um, and this is uh, President Bush and Mrs. Bush walking the uh, being walked by the Obamas out to the to the helicopter to take off. And here's President Obama getting on the helicopter. Then there's a luncheon. Uh, it's at the Capitol usually now, but to, here's Harry Truman at the White House uh, having his luncheon on Inauguration Day. This is what the Inauguration luncheon looked like in Statuary Hall uh, in 2017, uh, but apparently that is, luncheon is just not gonna happen this time. Then the parade begins, the, the president and the vice president and the two, first and second ladies uh, come down to start the parade, and these are the Obamas and the Bidens uh, walking down. This is what the parade route looked like for Thomas Jefferson's uh, inauguration. Uh, Jefferson had wanted the poplars planted along Pennsylvania Avenue, so that was the only place that was landscaped uh, by the government uh, at that time, uh, but this is what it looked like for Jefferson's parade, which is the first one in Washington. Uh, this is the first parade to be televised. It's Harry Truman's in 1949. That gives you an idea of what the parades uh, have looked like in the past. Uh, these are a couple of recent ones. The Obama's on the left, uh, and on the right is the um, uh, President Trump's inaugural parade. You can tell by the empty uh, spaces there where people are not watching. This is one of the more interesting floats that I found amongst the photographs of uh, past inaugurations, inaugural parades. Uh, of course, the most famous parade was the day before the inauguration in 1913 when the uh, women's champions of the right to vote uh, wanted to be in the inaugural parade and were refused, so they just had their own parade the day before. And uh, it was more famous than the inauguration parade at that time. Here's President uh, Jimmy Carter and Rosalind Carter walking along the parade route in 1977. There are other characters involved, of course, the first lady, and it's always um, uh, puts things into perspective to discuss the, the most infamous first lady, Jane Pierce in 1853. Uh, her family had opposed her marriage to a politician, and then she proceeds to have three sons, all of who died in childhood, one of them just before the inauguration. Uh, after the third son died, Mrs. Pierce demanded that her husband withdraw as president, uh, and refused to attend his inauguration. She spent the next two years on the second floor of the White House writing letters to her uh, deceased sons. And she was a prohibitionist and so no, no liquor was allowed in the White House. Uh, her best friend substituted as a hostess, that was Verena Davis, the wife of Jefferson Davis. And so she got to practice being hostess in the White House so that she could uh, be hostess in the Confederate White House later. Of course, another famous first lady is Mary Todd Lincoln. This is one of her many gowns, uh, probably the most famous one. Uh, here's Mrs. Coolidge with President Calvin Coolidge. Of course, he was not smiling. Um, and this is uh, Mrs. Hoover and Eleanor Roosevelt riding to the inauguration in 1933. This is an interesting picture because it shows four first ladies, one former, one current, and two future. On the left is Pat Nixon, who was a future first lady at this point. Uh, this is 1961. Uh, Mamie Eisenhower is the outgoing first lady, the departing one. Lady Bird Johnson, of course, is also a future first lady. And Jacqueline Kennedy uh, is the incoming first lady. It's an interesting uh, uh, screenshot here. Uh, and of course, Jacqueline Kennedy sets the standard for all first ladies um, to, uh, as, as fulfilling the role. Technology at the inauguration is always interesting. Uh, this is the 
a drawing of the railroad engine from 1841. Uh, probably it was an engine that looked a lot like this that brought President William Henry Harrison to his inauguration. He was the first president to arrive by train in 1841. Uh, in 1845, we used the telegraph for the first time. Uh, President James Polk's inauguration was the first recorded by telegraph. This is a drawing of Samuel Moore sitting in the Capitol building, uh, sending the first telegraph message. Um, and uh, the first newspaper illustration is this one. President Franklin Pierce in 1853 is the first to be uh, honored at his inauguration by uh, a newspaper illustration. Uh, this is the first photograph I showed you before of President James Buchanan's uh, uh, inauguration. Uh, this is the first moving picture taken in 1901 at President William McKinley's inauguration. You can watch it at, online at loc.gov. It's really interesting to see this first moving uh, picture of an inauguration. Uh, the first president to ride in a car in the inaugural parade is President Warren Harding in 1921. President Coolidge was the first one to speak by radio in his inaugural address in 1925. And uh, Harry Truman's the first one in 1949 to be on television. Uh, John Kennedy was the first one to be in color in 1961. And uh, in 1981, for Ronald Reagan, we introduced the jumbotrons. You can see them there arrayed down the mall, and uh, we use those for the crowds today. That's how technology has expanded the inauguration uh, at great lengths. Uh, this is President Obama on the jumbotron there, uh, where people could see the, what was going on uh, in front of them. The final helicopter ride was initiated by Jimmy Carter in 1981. The helicopter sits down on the grounds of the Capitol. And um, uh, so uh, that is another part of the ceremony that probably will not happen this time, depending upon the mood of the outgoing president. Clothing is something to pay attention to and some interesting things. These are drawings of early inaugurations, but we can assume the clothing is fairly accurate. That's Zachary Taylor on the left and James Buchanan on the right. You can see how they dressed uh, in that era. Uh, this is James Garfield in 1881, uh, a photograph. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, President Benjamin Harrison, 1893 on the left and uh, Grover Cleveland, the outgoing president and William McKinley, the incoming president in 1897. Um, here is uh, uh, President John Kennedy. Uh, he wore a top hat. He was the last president to do that. And you can see on the left, he's got on a morning coat, uh, as does uh, outgoing Vice President Nixon that he's talking to, the man he had defeated in the election. And behind, uh, we are seeing the backside of President Eisenhower and Sam Rayburn off on the, on the side there. Uh, here's President Kennedy in his morning coat giving his inaugural address. Lyndon Johnson is the one that freed future presidents from having to dress up uh, too much. And he gave his address in uh, a business suit and all the presidents since have done that. Now, one thing I noticed when, the, uh, when I was going through photographs is these odd hats for the chief justices. And I wondered whose idea was this? On the left is Chief Justice Taft in 1929 with that odd looking, uh, I suppose some kind of a historic judge's hat uh, and Chief Justice Vinson in 1949 also has on a, a scholar's hat like that. Um, but in between is Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes, who was famous for his uh, wonderful shock of hair and that luxurious mustache and beard. And uh, so he didn't wear that silly hat and neither did Earl Warren afterwards in 1969. We all know about the first ladies gowns. This particular inaugural gown was donated to the Smithsonian by Mrs. Taft in 1912. That's what started off the whole tradition of um, uh, first ladies gowns that led to the collection that's now at the Smithsonian. Uh, let me talk about historically significant inaugurations and make a guess at a few. Uh, of course, after George Washington, uh, then Thomas Jefferson with the revolution of 1800 and the first sort of hostile change in government 
and of uh, Jefferson's statement that, uh, in fact, it's the things we have in common that we celebrate at the inauguration. Uh, Andrew Jackson was significant both in 1825 and 1829. Uh, 1825, because he had won the popular vote, uh, but the House of Representatives had elected the other guy because there was no majority in the Electoral College and uh, kind of established the principle that the president needs to win the popular vote to be um, uh, appropriately president. So by 1829, Jackson was vindicated by winning both the popular vote and the Electoral College. And he celebrated that by introducing the spoils system where he fired all the government employees and replaced them with his supporters. And he had invited anybody that wanted a job to come to his inauguration and, and show their support. Um, and then uh, they would be given a job if they wanted it. In 1841, President Harrison is the first dark horse candidate. Uh, it looked like the country wanted anybody who was a non-Jacksonian. Uh, so he was elected without being very well known. Uh, he's the oldest president until Joe Biden. Uh, he had the longest inaugural address and the shortest administration because he died only a month after uh, his inauguration. And this caused the first vice president to have to assume the office of presidents. And so this becomes a very significant election. In 1861, of course, Abraham Lincoln uh, was inaugurated after a number of states had seceded already. So that makes it very significant. Uh, Grover Cleveland in 1885 is the first Democrat to be elected after the Civil War. Uh, and that was a matter of some significance. Uh, and Theodore Roosevelt, the first successor uh, vice president to be elected in his own right, uh, introduced a strong personality that we weren't used to in presidents and changed the tone of the presidency. And of course, Franklin Roosevelt in 1933 brought a new attitude toward government and the end of Republican dominance and really the introduction of Democrat uh, dominance uh, in our political system. And of course, Barack Obama, the first uh, major minority uh, president symbolizing uh, the way the country had come together around that issue in 2009. This is the first virtual inauguration, first inauguration where we've discouraged people from coming. Uh, weather and war have affected inaugurations, but never a pandemic or anything similar to that. So this, is, this will be remembered for that purpose. The pandemic conditions have led to canceled events, the luncheon in Statuary Hall and the inaugural balls. Uh, we've curtailed some of the events, the swearing in audience and the parade in in-person audience will be strictly limited as well. Uh, but there aren't gonna be any inaugural balls as we understand it, uh, but it's worth looking at tr tr the tradition. This is a drawing a reconstruction of what George Washington's inaugural ball must have looked like. Uh, this is the invitation to President Buchanan's inaugural ball with the names of everybody uh, on there in 1857. Uh, Lincoln's inaugural ball in 1861 was held at the patent office. Uh, having been in that room, I know this is an exaggerated drawing, but it must have been a nice place, uh, certainly the nicest place in Washington at that time. President Garfield inaugurated in 1881 at the Smithsonian Arts and Industries Building, and this is the decorations be beforehand. Uh, President McKinley in the pe Pension Building, I'm pretty sure I recognize the, the um, infrastructure there as being that in the pension building in 1897. Uh, here's Harry Truman in an interesting photograph of how inaugurations have changed. Uh, I, in speaking to other people, I understand that I'm one of the few that's old enough to remember all of these names, but uh, uh, in this photograph are some people that, whose names you might recognize, Edgar Bergen on the left, uh, Lena Horn. Um, George Jessel, Alice Fay, and Gene Kelly all there with a lot of other uh, Hollywood stars posing with Harry Truman in the middle. This is what we think of when we think of inaugural balls, Ronald Reagan and Nancy, George Bush and Barbara dancing. Uh, but this is more what they look like. This is a drawing of President Garfield's um, inauguration in 1881 in the Arts and Industries Building. And here's the real thing. This is what an inaugural ball really looks like. Uh, standing around in formal outfits uh, in lo long lines. And if you get inside, it looks like this. This is President Coolidge's uh, inauguration 1925, and he was not known as a party animal. Uh, so I'm not really sure we're gonna miss much by not having ina inaugural balls this year. 
But here are the anomalies about this election. There won't be any ball gowns if we don't have any, any uh, balls. And would Kamala Harris's gown have started a new collection at the Smithsonian? And we need to ask, should the female vice presidents and future presidents start a new collection of swearing in fashions to equal uh, the one that's at the Smithsonian? But in the end, do we care? Um, this time we have a problem with a former president who may stage in alternative events. Uh, he certainly will stage news events, denunciations and accusations around the inauguration. Uh, he's threatened to refuse to attend official events, the swearing in, the address, and the helicopter departure. Uh, so will there be an alternative swearing in ceremony or alternative balls? We will have to find out. I don't know yet. So there we are. That's a quick review of the, of the inauguration, some highlights I wanted to share with you. Uh, I've prepared a document which I'm giving to the Guild for distribution. Uh, I've accumulated this over uh, time since 1996, when I gave my first, or 1997, that is, when I gave my first uh, inaugural talk to the Guild of Professional Tour Guides of Washington. Uh, so this is a accumulated trivia. Uh, that you, that uh, guides can use in uh, talking about the inauguration. So uh, again, I apologize for not being there to um, uh, uh, to give this talk directly and to answer questions. Uh, but we hope you have a good program, and I can assure you that I will be laying in the sunshine in the tropics, uh, thinking about you today. Thank you.